Thank you, thank you so much, ma'am. Ladies and gentlemen, now let's move on to our next session. Yes, session nine. And uh, how do we make a city grow? Yes, make it the best place it can be for the people who already live in. Community development is an essential part of urban planning. And uh, we all know that this holds true, not just in the type of structures that are built for work, stay and play, but also in the very initiatives that guide urban living. Exploring the different aspects of community-centric design, we have a riveting lineup of speakers. Ladies and gentlemen, now our first speaker in this session is uh, Mr. Sameep Padora. Ladies and gentlemen, he studied architecture and planning in, in Los Angeles and New York, graduated with Masters in Design Studies from Harvard University in 2005. He then chose to move to his homeland to explore his professional prowess, leading to geniuses of his firm, SP Plus A. Ladies and gentlemen, characterized by sustainability, Mr. Sameep Padora's work charter begins by addressing the context of a project and also by challenging it. So here we have the gentleman himself. Welcome, sir. So uh, the, the title of my talk this evening is uh, The Inherent Smartness of Cities. Uh, what I'm basically arguing for here is that uh, the way that our cities have evolved and are structured today, uh, there is a certain amount of intelligence that is almost coded into its evolution. And what I'm going to do uh, is basically show a few projects that we've done. It doesn't cover the kind of width of all of the work that we're involved in, but it just kind of covers a range. Um, First, let me go back to you know what has been uh, the major kind of stress on uh, uh, on the conversations that we've had today is, is this idea of technology and really what the uh, what the mandate of this uh, this is, which you know there are there are uh, in in a, in a kind of response to this uh, idea of. Uh, uh, technology taking over our lives in a certain extent. There's nothing uh, good or bad about it, but uh, one starts to kind of re uh, think through as to what this actually uh, means for um, uh, for any kind of lifestyle that uh, we might have, and 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 also other aspects. So let's just get back to how this kind of impacts the person, and this goes back to what uh, uh, the gentleman from Bureau Hapold sh uh, showed the the Maslow's uh, hierarchy of needs, and how you know you kind of go right within, start looking at these, uh, at, you know, at the kind of idea of actualizing uh, your your kind of uh, uh, existence, and then how that kind of spreads outwards towards the bottom, and how we, in today's time it actually kind of you know might be uh, even this, right? So that's that becomes almost a kind of basic need and there are lots of memes online that actually kind of question this notion of technology you know about smart people uh, and where are they um, and uh how that, in a sense, is is really the kind of uh, cornerstone, and even at some point, some th uh, things that are really much more serious. That uh, and how much impact does it have through the cross section of our, our society? Uh, Rem Kulas, who is uh, in in architectural uh, circles nowadays, the Grim Reaper, uh, kind of uh, is also in in a sense kind of sounded the death knell for uh, for smart cities, asking whether uh, smart cities really make us stupid, or uh, for for in another case where uh, we are we are our, our kind of democratic rights are being kind of in some sense bargained uh, away as well. Um, but I'm not as pessimistic as that, But I'm, and, and I really think technology is a good thing. Uh, but what I'm really interested in is uh, the kind of embedded smartness in cities, the, the, kind, of, uh, the kind of smartness that, that emerges out of, uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, evolution of both uh, process and, uh, and uh, typology. Um, you see evidence of this. Of course, these cliches are uh, are very well known. Uh, the Dabawalas and their kind of Six Sigma system of delivery. Uh, the uh, the idea that Dharavi is uh, you know a 600 million dollar economy uh, you know four or five years ago, or that 60 percent of Mumbai walks to work. All of these these various ideas, in some sense talk about processes that seem to be good for uh, for our cities right um, but what it uh, doesn't talk about however is the fact that uh, each of these processes is contingent uh, or is kind of symbiotic with a particular type which is an architectural uh, you know kind of presence in the city as well um, what I'm going to do is uh, what I'm showing you now is just as uh, this is where I where I'm based out of in 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 Bombay this is Bandra and this is Bandra back in the 1600s this is just uh, around the time that the Portuguese 
Gandhi's got there. And it was a collection of 21 villages. So we did a, a bit of research to figure out what happened in between. And I'm just showing you maps. Uh, we have maps at various stages in, in Bandra's evolution, but I'm just showing you stuff that, uh, that, that shows Bandra in the 1600s to what it's become now. And uh, it's, it's essentially a kind of manifestation of any other kind of post-colonial city where, the, where the, the grid becomes this kind of extension of a kind of planning mechanism rather than a kind of lifestyle uh, idea or a kind of... Uh, uh, a kind of manifestation of what how people actually uh, live. So what uh, that's also uh, done is uh, it's created. Sorry, it's not moving. Yeah, okay. So what what it's done is also that the the kind of mindless application of the TPS or the town planning schemes in Bandra Khar and these other areas meant that there is a kind of lacuna, right? So all of the uh, the stuff that's integral to our kind of living, for instance, gets uh, starts existing in the interstices of the formal city. So whether it's uh, well, for for instance, people who kind of uh, sell things, uh, whether as radiwalas or people who are kind of working in people's houses as chauffeurs or other other kind of domestic help of any kind, uh, end up living close to where they work. But since there is no uh, kind of uh, provision for, for housing, they become payment dwellers and, and so on and so forth. Uh, markets uh, are kind of exist within these kind of interstitials as well, as well as the gautans then get kind of compressed by the real estate pressures of the city and then become these really slim uh, entities uh, of sorts. And then finally, the only kind of open space that we've, we are left with are the promenades, uh, stuff that uh, Mr. Das had worked on and that he showed earlier. So it's really this, this, this idea that that our cities need to kind of look at alternate typologies for for uh, for kind of planning in the future. We cannot go by the, 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 the way that the city had been planned thus far, looking at the uses and the kind of housing types that we've seen, which in, in all kind of formal planning mechanisms is the default apartment, right? So these are just drawings that again kind of depict uh, the urban villages. The blue stuff is the urban villages that uh, that exist in uh, Bandra, and what you see in red are the the informal settlements or the slums that have kind of developed that provide housing that actually uh, you, uh, is inhabited by people who service the formal city. Um, and these are uh, the the little red uh, kind of. Uh, squares that you see are markets that have kind of come up throughout the formal city as well, while the only two planned markets are the ones that you uh, see in the blue there. So the idea is that the city, in a sense, creates its own infrastructure if it, it doesn't exist already. And really what uh, we're trying to kind of, uh, what I'm trying to kind of argue here is that for that, uh, the city to kind of behave as this kind of, uh, kind of dense network of associations, you need these kind of uh, uh, interstitial uh, uh, can, uh, programs to exist. And our planning mechanisms don't allow for that. So so the, the, the argument that I'm making here is for uh, to look at typologies, to look at types of project, to types of projects in the city. Uh, and now specifically talking about Mumbai and talking about housing, um, if you uh, were to kind of look at the history of uh, Bombay, the one particular uh, typology of housing in Bombay is the Chal, which came up from this kind of worker-related housing, but it mutated over time to not, to not only include uh, workers, but also had families and uh, relatives from villages, and, and everybody kind of lived together in, uh, in this really kind of dense uh, system. On the left and right, you actually see uh, the insides of uh, a Chal, and what you see in the middle is actually corridor space. It's common corridor space, which becomes a de facto living room. On the upper level, at another, in another chawl, the, the middle space actually has skylights that are kind of punched through it. And they actually create this entire thing almost into a quasi-courtyard. Now, the argument uh, here that I'm making again is that the, it isn't the, the original design of the chawl that is, that is critical. It is the, the design by appropriation that becomes important. That is what we want to kind of learn from. This is also a part of a kind of exercise that we are doing uh, in documenting affordable housing types in Bombay currently, which will open in January. Um, the other example that we have from uh, Bombay is this kind of uh, informal settlement or the homegrown settlement, which in itself, this is along Carter Road. It actually, just for the sake of the, since uh, Sarita got a lot of uh, applause for, the, for talking about Salman Khan, this is actually real, exactly where uh, Shah Rukh Khan used to stay. Behind this, there's a building where Shah Rukh Khan used to stay. So you could actually rent, an apart you could rent a room on this bang on the sea face in Bandra for 5,000 rupees a month. 
and stay close to probably the most expensive real estate in the city. Now, the, the point here again is that there are no formal mechanisms that will allow you for, for, for kind of provide housing like this. And this really is actually kind of providing a need for the city, otherwise it wouldn't exist. So it's, it's, it's very clear that this relation is symbiotic. And when you then start looking at uh, the, uh, the, the kind of settlement per se, you start also reading that there is a complex mix of program within the entire system. There is a kind of commercial, residential program, there is circulation, there are kind of smaller kind of, uh, communities that, uh, that, you know, so these guys only kind of rent out to people who come from their village. So there are, there are kind of mini ecosystems within this ecosystem. Um, so it really becomes interesting to start looking at all of this and then start understanding that these could be means uh, to develop new typologies for our, our cities in the future. Um, and then once there's a kind of understanding, then there's this potential of projecting. I mean, you can actually use this as a mechanism, as a datum to project uh, from. Uh, these are projects that we are currently working on in Mumbai. This is an affordable housing project uh, where we are looking at uh, uh, shared amenities being a kind of central uh, space that runs through the entire apartment. Uh, through the entire apartment building, it's it's loosely based on the chawl. What you see here is a cross section where the living where the living room uh, programs again get incorporated as a part of that central common space. And in our case, it actually becomes double height, so you have a kind of sectional uh, collaboration as well. Uh, and the kind of uh, the kind of uh, common spaces happen uh, right here. Actually, I don't know if you can see that, but we have also that section in the middle there is where all the common spaces happen. So you're not getting people to go down four stories, you, they come to a middle level and then kind of move through that as well. So these are just kind of visualizations of uh, that project. And what it does is because of the fact that these uh, these kind of community spaces are tied so closely to the kind of living programs at, in, at the mid-levels, they also get maintained a lot more intimately than they would uh, if they were completely separated from the kind of residential uh, or the living spaces. Uh, th these are, this is a, a second part of a project, a second part of the, the, the presentation is about a project that we've done with uh, the students of Sir JJ College of Architecture. It's a, it's a research that we had done uh, with JJ, so the students and herbs, where we kind of studied the kind of, uh, the implementation of a house in Dharavi. So people were actually building a house in 45 days flat. Uh, between two other houses, so what you can see here is the actual kind of process of con construction in, in 35 days. And it's, it's so super smooth that you know exactly at what point which uh, con contractor comes in to do what kind of work. Uh, so whilst, uh, uh, you know, you kind of uh, think about the fact that people uh, living in uh, homegrown settlements like this don't really have access to resources. They're actually spending up to 1,500 rupees a square foot to build here. So what they don't really have is access to real estate. But so these are really kind of tight plots and they don't really have space to, uh, to, to kind of build on. Uh, because they're always building between two, uh, one or two other uh, settlements. So uh, what you also see is that the outdoor spaces are very well articulated. They're very well used by people. Temporarily, the, the kind of use changes. Kids are playing there during the day. Women are actually drying uh, papad and uh, things like that. Uh, in the evening, uh, it becomes a parking and for gathering space, for, for festivals. The edges of the houses are also very, very immaculately detailed. So you'll see uh, these kind of spaces where people leave their shoes outside, but there are steps so they can sit, chat with the neighbor. So the idea of the inside and the outside is really kind of very fluid. Um, the, the, the implementation of the house itself is technically very interesting. It, it kind, of, uh, kind of reverses almost all of uh, all structural logic that one might actually uh, kind of think of, but it's very, very effective. Uh, the only uh, real kind of uh, issue here is that when, they actually, when they're actually building here, they're building like they build in the formal city, a slab upon a slab. Uh, they cannot go beyond a certain height officially because there is a cap of 14 feet. Uh, but what they tend to do is that they tend to build incrementally over time and add, keep adding floors gradually. Um, so what we did for this scheme was we actually kind of uh, generated a kind of anthropometric understanding of that section and did a, a kind of section that maximizes the amount of space that you actually need for each program. And then it really becomes a kind of series of various levels that are, scat that are kind of scattered through the section of the space. It almost becomes a kind of furniture piece. 
uh, and uh, what you actually end up getting uh, in real terms is almost 150 square feet more within the same volume, which is direct. Uh, it's, which is a direct benefit because we, people can rent out those spaces. They can use them for production of, uh, you know, uh, whatever other kind of uh, commercial interests that they are kind of involved with. Um, so the idea was that we could actually use a, a kind of a similar volume but create more uh, real estate. Um, we also worked with the local contractors. In this case, we actually did a did a house. We did a office for herbs. Uh, we collaborated with herbs to do an office out of EPS. We built a machine from whatever material was available on site in the, in Shivaji Nagar here and uh, cut those e EPS blocks at angles and then kind of did this uh, vault like uh, studio space. So the idea is to also uh, look at the. Um, uh, look at uh, the settlement as uh, as a kind of as an opportunity of, for resources that you can actually uh, mobilize to to construct. Uh, and lastly, we kind of used all of this uh, information to then uh, uh, speculate on a, uh, on an application that is much larger. So what so what we were arguing for in this case is in Subhash Nagar in in Dharavi, we were arguing that uh, people building in these areas are already building with a certain amount of intelligence uh, uh, and and also with a certain amount of speculation in terms of how they increase the house over time. Um, and this is uh, the kind of structure that's uh, that's actually working very effectively. Um, what is, however, a bottleneck here is is infrastructure. So there are there there could be structural issues. There might be issues of uh, drainage and water supply. Uh, so what we really need to kind of uh, acknowledge is the fact that uh, settlements like these are the only real settlements in the city for affordable housing. So if I come as a migrant labor to come and uh, and work in Mumbai, these are the only places I can actually stay in. And uh, what we then proposed was uh, I kind of plugging in what was missing, which is basically infrastructure. So we worked on a scheme where we actually use an infrastructural jacket that extends around the existing fabric, allowing them to build further over time. So you can further densify the fabric as and when needed. Uh, and also uh, de-densify at ground. So what these are kind of, this is a speculation of, so, uh, of the transit camp area where we looked at this infrastructural jacket rising above the house, uh, which then gets filled up over time. Uh, to create a fabric that's uh, that's similar in its kind of vitality, but also creates these alternate spaces at multiple levels, which you could also use, uh, like the use ground spaces. Uh, sir, I'm sorry to interrupt. We have sure. five more minutes. All right, I'll be, I'll be done soon. Uh, I'm just going to uh, do two more sections. One is the idea of uh, the, the first idea that I spoke about was the idea of. Uh, looking at uh, mining types, looking at existing types, and then kind of learning from that. This is uh, a, a few projects that we, that we kind of did in Ahmedabad, where we looked at those are the two sites. Uh, we were kind of building on a corridor which is supposedly which supposedly has the least amount of green space in the whole of uh, Ahmedabad, which is the SG Highway, though there is a kind of uh, government uh, mandate to create uh, this as a kind of uh, greenway, but there's no such work done on it. So as a developer who owns this site, what we were proposing is that we build the greenway uh, from the nearest BRTS uh, stop to our site, uh, allowing people to kind of walk to the site and then also to further extend that green space into our project uh, itself. Hence, creating a space for the city and where the project then has the potential to, to in some sense, influence the city or create space for the city. We also built in, uh, um, uh, we built in a recycling unit whereby any kind of dry waste produced on our site is actually recycled on our site. And this facility is also then offered to uh, the neighborhood that it sits in. And hence, we are also kind of uh, asking for more FSI to kind of incorporate this. Um, that these are kind of visualizations of that green space coming into the site. That's the entire plaza at night. Parts of it are covered uh, because of the weather. The second project uses that greenway, extends it as a as a kind of vertical street onto the onto a building that is supposed to have a lot of retail program. So what we are doing is creating a series of one is to thirteen uh, sloped ramps that allow you uh, access to all of these terraces and the retails at those levels. In a sense, reversing the idea of the mall, creating a kind of retail space that is is also a plaza for the city uh, and it kind of works well with our corner location too uh, these are just kind of renders of that and i'm going to end with uh, uh, the video that uh, a video that was shown at the moma tactical urbanism uh, um, exhibition which uh, where uh, uh, where we actually documented the the work that we did in while we built a house in shivaji nagar which is a uh, which is a kind of uh, a low income housing uh, project in uh, uh, Bombay.
you can play it from there. It's fine. Audio. मेरा फोटो ले रहे हो। Thank you, thank you so much, sir, for such an interesting session. And ladies and gentlemen, now let's move on to our next speaker. I would like to invite on stage Mr. Sander Ledrer, co-founder and CEO of K-Monitor, a watchdog NGO for public funds in Hungary. 
Ladies and gentlemen, K Monitor was founded with the aim of raising awareness about the issues of corruption to bring a new level of transparency in the field of governance for the purpose of fostering democracy and the rule of law in Hungary. K Monitor operates open data websites, conducts research, and advocates for legal reform. In 2012, K-Monitor developed a website called The Network, a database and an interactive map on political and economic elite networks, public procurements, farm subsidies and EU funding. So ladies and gentlemen, I would like to invite Mr. Sandor on stage. Can we have you round of applause please for him? Thank you. Welcome sir. Hello, good afternoon. Okay, so um, thank you for having me here. Um, so I'm the founder of this Hungarian NGO called K Monitor, and as you can see, we do um, three. Uh, we have three pillars of operation: technology, advocacy, and research. And um, I will talk in detail about a campaign that we did um, last year, which called "This is the Minimum." and it targeted cities and local governments in Hungary. But before that, to have an idea what we're doing um, generally, I will tell you briefly about some of our projects. Um, <clears throat> this was a project we did um, also at the uh, end of last year, beginning of this year. As told in the introduction, we have a huge database of corruption cases in the country. It's like a library of certain corruption cases. And, um, and we started to put them on a map. And the tool that we developed is a mobile app, looks like this. Um, so if you walk around in Hungary, in any city of Hungary, then you can track what kind of corruption uh, occurred nearby. We thought that it is important to do that, to give people, to make, to make corruption touchable in a way that it's not something that happened in the news and it's about big numbers, but you can really walk by and see, okay, this building was sold for this amount of money and this mayor benefited from that, or this businessman is the guy who, who, who got it. And of course you can, um, if you live in certain neighborhoods, you can subscribe. So if you live in one district of Budapest or you live in a remote town, you can subscribe and you get notified anytime corruption um, happens or at least when it's reported about that. And of course you can also track politicians, companies, or state institutions um, that are involved. And of course, you can also send us stories. I know in India, there is a, a project where you can report um, paying a bribe. So the idea is something similar, but it, here it is um, built on stories from the news. Um, another project that we did this year, this is quite recent, we just introduced it some weeks ago, is about public procurement. It's um, as you know, in the in the morning we hear that that um, often half of public funds spent don't reach those who who it should be reaching. Um, it goes wasted or it goes to pockets of uh, certain people. Now you have to see that public procurement is one of the main channels where public money reaches the private sector, and often where these sectors meet, there is where corruption occurs. So what we, we wanted to do is building a tool that helps journalists, that helps watchdogs, or even the authorities to find those uh, procurement that might be risky. So we developed an algorithm built on um, expert assessment, on practical information, um, um, and defined red flags saying, okay, what, is, what, what does a risk mean if it comes to public procurement? And then we built a huge database out of it, which is refreshed on a daily basis. So every time procurement documents appear in the central procurement database, Either it is a it is a call for a contract or it is an avar notice. Then this program goes through it and it shows whether there are risks. It gets flagged with all those risks, and if you go into this, you can read them in detail. And then, of course, um, uh, journalists can write about it, or people can turn to the authorities. And the third thing that we did this year is a corruption test. 
a corruption personality test because we also wanted to show people that corruption is is not just happening in in uh, high above in the political elite but it is something that we participate in often in our everyday life with certain decisions um, and um, and it, it 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 should make us conscious in a way uh, in our behavior um, how to handle these situations. So what we did, it was quite popular because it, it was something that you can embed in your website. So all kinds of news portals spread it and people had to answer 15 questions and after and it, it, got, uh, it, it got an evaluation how high the propensity for corruption in, in their case is. So um, these are certain tools that we worked on. But of course they were targeting mostly individuals and it was was like in a way tools that we start we, we did because we, we, we found that the state isn't uh, fulfilling in ta its task in fighting corruption and the, 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 the project I want to go more into detail is this minimum program which is a, an advocacy campaign that we did um, it was important because we in here we address the authorities or decision makers much more so uh, just a bit about uh, the context um, generally, you know, we call it freedom of information. I think here in India you say rather right to information, but it's uh, the same thing that you have access to information about public spending, about budgets, so it can, you can see what taxpayer money, what your money is spent on by the government. So we have a quite good act, but the problem with this is that it's not really fulfilled by government agencies, neither um, by local municipalities. Um, also, the problem is that if, if it's fulfilled, so if data is published, it's often in a way that's not understandable, it's not in a machine-readable way, so it's like PDF files or scanned files uploaded in a web page and it's almost as it wouldn't be there. Another problem also is that the government in Hungary at the moment, which is in power for five years now, it has a very strong majority which um, leads to the fact that they're not really open to any kind of compromises. So they, they work uh, as, as being in a one-party system, not taking care about NGOs, not, um, not um, dealing with the opposition. And of course, this is quite comfortable ruling, uh, ruling a country in, in this. And what they don't like, um, because this is endangering power, is transparency and is uh, participation of others and of course citizens. So, for us as an NGO, which has uh, among uh, certain goals uh, also or activities advocacy, so we try to make better laws, we try to influence lawmaking, this is a horrible situation because we have no partner on the national and the government side, but there's nobody we can talk to and nobody who listens to us. So we were thinking, okay, how can we make things better in such a situation? Um, what should we do to have an impact? And then we said, okay, let's go one step back, let's go to the cities, let's go to villages, let's go to the municipal level, which has a much more direct contact to citizens, and also you have much more options since there are hundreds of uh, cities and municipalities in the country, so you should find some of them who are partners, and of course they are, have the, the autonomy to act uh, much more, let's say, open than the government does. Uh, so sorry to interrupt, <coughs> uh, you have five more minutes. Okay, I will hurry up. Yeah. So what we did was um, we, 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 we de de defined a pledge for the local elections last year in 2014 and said there are four important issues that we want local uh, candidates to take commitments on. One was the transparency of the local budget to make it to make it available and also to present it in a way that people really can understand it. What is the money spent for and what relation it is to other spendings, what incomes the local government has, to encourage people to get interested in how uh, the municipality is working. The same with contracts. As I said, they sometimes upload it, but we wanted to have good databases. So some, if somebody interested in a certain topic like school, then he can find all kinds of contracts. This is like about reconstruction of the school 
or, or a certain school program that was uh, done by the local government. Same with agenda proposals of minutes. This is the way people can really have an insight in how the local municipality is working, what topics they're discussing. Of course, nobody knows what's, do, what's happening in the town hall if nothing of this information is public. But if there's a good database, and I'm, 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 I'm interested in, in all kinds of issues about schooling, then I, can, I could quite easily search and even go to those meetings meetings or, or hearings um, or sessions of the local municipality where decisions are made that are important for me. And the fourth thing, of course, um, if we talk about corruption, is asset declarations, so the enrichment of, of local decision makers, asset declarations also uh, shall be public. So these were the four um, minimum points that we, that we designed. And then we ran a campaign before the elections, and this is the map of Hungary with all those cities and towns where we got candidates that signed this pledge. It was over 200. And afterwards, from these, um, 50 were elected. So we immediately started working with them. And, um, in, and, and this is Budapest, the capital city, where you have districts, so there were several. And in, in a quite short time, we achieved a change in several of, of, uh, of these districts, which means that the, low, the mayor or, or uh, the local assembly um, made a decree or made a local law which, uh, which enabled uh, or made these things happen that we requested. Um, of course, there were, there were places where people got passive, or it was also what quite often happened that those who signed this pledge remained in a minority in the local council. So they tried to make a change, but of course, there were people didn't vote. The other, other the majority didn't vote for it. But something which, uh, which even surprised us was very interesting. It was that. Um, it was that even at places where, where our partners were in a minority and uh, the emotions were voted down, afterwards the mayor sometimes took over elements and adopted it because he saw it's quite, it's quite bad for his reputation if it becomes public that he's against transparency. So even in this way, we could achieve in certain uh, districts uh, success. So what we learned from this project, and, 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 um, and, and also that's the reason we um, continue working on this, is that we saw that in, in cases where you have very strict national governments or regional governments that are not really cooperative, you can find your partners on the local level and you can start up building up good examples from piece by piece from little. Also, um, on the local level, I think because people know each other much more and know the local problems much more, there is a, a higher um, ability and a higher uh, openness towards cooperation between different political parties. And also a very interesting thing that we learned was um, bad decisions are not always taken because politicians are bad or they're corrupt. It's often because the lack of skills and knowledge. So what it was very important to us to see that we have to provide materials, we have to provide provide draft laws to help them to uh, adopt good um, regulations and often they were really, ha really happy and, uh, and really um, um, in a partnership with us to, to implement them. So what's happening next? Um, we, of course there were places uh, where we, we couldn't achieve a change yet so we start working on that. Um, so we also... Uh, just one more minute for you. Okay. <coughs> This is the last slide. So um, um, we, we, we want to extend the campaign to towns where we see there is a change uh, for a change. For this, we also we would like to involve citizens. So we set up a new web page for this. And we also do campaigns locally and encourage people to write to their mayors saying, OK, participate in this campaign. Make your cities more transparent. And of course, we do. Uh, we propose amendments where uh, we are not happy with the solutions um, that that's happening. And why do we do this? Because we think um, in 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 our communities, power went too far away from the people, and we have to get it back to those who it is about. And and for this, we need more transparency and knowledge, so people know what uh, what's happening around them. And of course, we need to encourage them to participate. And I think um, if 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 uh, information is shared and knowledge in, is shared, there is also a greater willing from people to participate. So um, that's what be doing now. Thank you very much for listening, please. <coughs> Thank
Thank you so much, sir. Now I would like to invite on stage Ms. Archana Prasad, the co-founder of Jaga.in, a community space in Bangalore aimed at supporting local arts and technology communities. Can we have you, ma'am, please on stage? Thanks so much for having me. Um, I'm going to actually breeze through the first couple of points, the first two versions of Jaga. Jaga started as an art project between my partner uh, Freeman and me. He comes from the technology world, I came from the art and design world, and we thought it would be interesting to have some kind of a creative space that was shared between our two communities. Right? Um, we thought, let's bring them together and let's see what happens. It was going to be a temporary project, maybe three months, maybe six months. Nothing, nothing too long drawn. This was in 2009. Um, a friend of ours loaned us a small plot of land. It was a piece of waste land. We used pallet racks. Um, these are like modular steel structures that are used typically for shelving. And we created um, a building. A we called it the living building, eight and a half meters high, um, and then it actually took about 15 hours to construct the skeleton, and then after that we started decking it out with all kinds of things, vertical gardens, um, you know, um, found art, so trash, so how do, how do you use trash, how do you um, upcycle, use billboards on the outside to create a skin. Um, inside was interesting. We'd have all kinds of people come in and use our space. So you can see here, you know, dance performances to exhibitions to um, talks, bar camps, all kinds of great stuff. Um, we ran this in the space for about, um, I'd say about 12, 14 months. And some of the things we learned from doing that, I mean, much longer than we intended the project to run, just because it was adopted by these people so fast, we thought, okay, both communities, the technology communities and the design creative communities, really kind of took to this space and felt it was their own. They built it, they owned it. The other thing is that because it was the shared kind of ownership, this interdisciplinary learning just happened organically. And lastly, what we saw was that the, that the people who were hanging out there, whether just to watch or whether to showcase what they were doing, had started to talk more and more earnestly about um, do good read for the city. At that time, I made this, um, this little simplistic diagram, what is Jaga? As some of us know, Jaga in Kannada means space, in Hindi it means awakened. But I really tried to understand it, and I thought, maybe it's space and people. It's just that simple. Version two, about 15 months into the project, we thought, okay, we need to get a little bigger because I, we felt that this, these groups that were doing these multiple types of activities needed slightly more dedicated spaces, much like an auditorium or something like that. So we moved to this space. It was about um, it was a big trash dump, about uh, four and a half feet of urban trash, uh, set on a plot of land that was 80 feet by 100 feet um, in a very, very busy part of Bangalore. This is where we live. And a um, small group of volunteers, us and a few hired on workers, I think a team of about 12, we rehabilitated the land, found that it was exceedingly fertile and grew very green, very beautifully. And up came the structure, large auditorium that could convert into gallery space. Below that was um, space for flea markets, cafes, we had co-working, we had a special screening room. It was thick with activity, right? At this point, we were doing two, three events a day. <laughs> As you can see, some crazy numbers, all of this documented. And clearly what we learned from that 18 months was that we, we certainly have cracked what a community space looks like. This is what it is. It's community-driven 
activities. People would come, they would sign up online forms, hold their um, programs, we would support them. It was great. What was also interesting that as we had started in 2009, some of the ideas that were being talked about, just over coffees or you know casually in, in, in like tea breaks and things like that, had actually started to become organizations of sorts. You know, ideas had become sort of real. People had started to commit, leave mainstream jobs to, to set up their startup or go after their NGO idea or, or really start to engage. And I thought that, okay, let's revisit this diagram. What is Jaga? It's a little bit kind of more real. It's stayed now for about four years. It's definitely a space, but I think it's more than just bringing people together. It's providing some kind of programmatic assistance to the people that have grown with us. And so we started to th in 2014, in the beginning of 2014, um, we decided to kind of take apart our program a little bit. And we, we provided Jaga Startup, which then gave clear programming for our technology entrepreneurs, mentorship, guidance, all of that in a very simple, white, penthouse kind of space. And we took art and design out of the building and into public space. And we thought, OK, I don't know if we need galleries. We don't need auditoriums. I think what we need to do is get our designers and artists into the streets. Let's see what that looks like. A quick segue simultaneously, we were also working with central government organizations like um, uh, Department of Science and Technology doing um, kind of large scale documentation of humpy crafts, living crafts, people who, who kind of were the last in their line um, with the certain crafts that they knew, um, documenting, documenting them on video and then kind of presenting them online. So this is just a background thing. You'll see how it ties up towards the end. What happens when you take artists and designers onto the streets? I think in a previous presentation, um, I think Ratan made um, beauty and the beast kind of stuff. It is important to engage the designers and the artists with a solid foundation of research. So this project called the Urban Avant-Garde followed closely a project which we did with the local government agency called the Malaysian Accessibility Project. This was deep surveys into understanding what made for more kind of NMT style um, access to the, the small neighborhood that had gotten congested with traffic, with, you know, inaccessible sidewalks, it had just become kind of nightmarish to live in. And after a three-month research process, we invited designers and artists both nationally and internationally to look at that research and kind of present it back to the people in ways that they could understand and ways that they could participate in. So this was an early attempt at you know, taking it out into the streets. We uh, worked with BMTC, local bus uh, transport services, kind of started to talk about things, involved the, the communities that lived and worked there and studied there in the process of this art uh, Ma'am, sorry to interrupt. You have uh, less than five minutes. No problem. We then adopted flyover spaces, right? Um, we're looking at um, really derelict under the flyover, these big alien infrastructural pieces under which for women, for, for just kind of scary, nightmarish, trashed areas. And we invited 10 artists to engage with it closely week on week for a, pr a process of six months in 2014. And slowly, with the community, using kind of sub subversive methods, using community participatory methods, they started to rehabilitate the space, but constantly involving people, right? Another project, taking over a toilet space um, in a local park, working with community groups. Another flyover, different type of community engagement, leave your mark on the city quite literally. Um, and now to this project, which will launch in, um, in a couple of weeks, Malaysia Calling, where we kind of try to bring our technology support 
into public space under these flyovers that we've adopted. Now Jaga has adopted more than five of these flyovers across Bangalore City. And we look at trying to kind of grab hold of these stories of old neighborhoods, this particular neighborhood, Maleshram, one of the oldest in the city, follow oral history and ethnography processes, and kind of create a phone booth that enables people to walk in and access stories that made this neighborhood special. So kind of going towards the direction of place making in nowhere spaces of cities, right? Um, this is my concluding statement. But I'll, I'll just leave you with this. I think I'm just going to underline some things that um, previous presenters, um, Kalpana, Anjali, um, Sandeep, Ratan, all of them talk about, is that all of these things, these large infrastructural planning, these kind of huge urban planning um, ideas, 100 smart cities, 1,000, all of that, it's all great. Eventually, it's the people. It is critical, absolutely critical, to have a human-centered process, participatory and inclusive, so that they're actually able to, as designers and artists, I think especially we are able to make that bridge between government agencies, between large infrastructure projects, down to that small little boy who doesn't quite get it, but can actually be engaged and be, be a teacher, you know? We can learn from these, from these ideas. So I'll leave you with that. Thank you so much. Yes, uh, very rightly said. It's first the people, then the technology. And now I would like to invite on stage Ms. Mriganka Saxena. She's the founding partner of Habitat Tectonics, Architecture and Urbanism, a Delhi-based architecture and urban design studio. Welcome, ma'am. Uh, hi, um, I have a um, personal inclination to work at the interface of policy and design, so that's what I'll be talking about. <clears throat> Especially it's important because um, in a session where we're looking at experimentation, I think it's very important to create an environment where experiments can happen more as a norm rather than an exception. So, um, could this go on? Yeah, so we're looking at policy. Before I get down to how policy can create that environment, um, I think we'll just do a quick recap on uh, what we're facing. Yeah? So going straight in, uh, urbanization, we've talked about it, 377 million people going to about 900 million uh, by 2050, which is about three times the population of America. Uh, what is interesting here, though, is that the 377 million is actually spread across six different types of urban settlements. If you look at the little circles on the bottom, ranging from 30 million to 55 million or 76 million, Im implying that no one type of urban settlement can actually be ignored. We need to be working across scales, across hierarchies of settlement. Biggest challenge, of course, providing shelter employment, economic uh, opportunities, basic infrastructure. What we really need to understand is the actual magnitude of um, magnitude, the, the impact of social, economic, um, social, environmental, and economic impact on the quality of life of magna. Uh, of um, urbanization of such magnitude that's facing, um, that India is facing. So what's the state of our cities today? It's burdened. Housing shortfall is massive, 30 million by 2020, 19 million right now, which means that most of our people are living like this. There is a bit of romance in how uh, lovely these things look, but they are not habitable spaces. Uh, the newer ones, the better facilities are faceless. Uh, mobility is severely hampered. We talk about issues of congestion, unsafety, uh, pollution. We have the high, we have 11% of global road injury deaths in the country every year, uh, which is equivalent to wiping off 40% of uh, nations like Maldives every year. We really need to take stock of what we're doing. For the everyday man, um, it's that at the arterial level. Even for pedestrians, it's really not comfortable or a pleasure to move around in our cities. Our densities, they're so complex, they're incomprehensible, be it resident or transient densities, we don't know how to manage them. Our infrastructure is burdened, crumbling, be it solid waste management, be it water, even our social structures crumbling. Um, 
there is sustained degeneration of cities. And I say it's sustained um, not only in terms of infrastructure, but there's loss of identity. We are sort of sustainably creating placeless places, neglected places, lowering quality of life, and there is a sustained lack of civic pride, which is a massive issue for our cities. We do have solutions, but they're unidimensional. You provide housing, you're not looking at urban life. You have jobs, but no local identity. Sorry to be using this example, New India, but where is this place, really? Um, similar, what are we talking about? Where is India and all of this? Where is community in all of this? And where is place in all of this? Um, traditionally, we built with an innate sense of place. We knew what we were building. We were responding to the genus loci of our places, responding to the social and economic realities of a setting. What that gave us was a collective response, which was actually making each of our urban settlements distinct. It was unique. You may say this, this is no, no longer relevant for our cities today because they're far more complex. We're looking at larger numbers, larger densities. But there are certain things, if you strip it down, there are two questions I believe are critical for us to answer when we're looking at urban situations. First one, do our cities offer choice? Choice is intrinsically linked to the quality of life. Do, we, do I have a choice of where I live, how I live? Can I choose how I travel to work or am I forced to take my car out every day? Uh, am I forced to ride a cycle for 20 kilometers to get to work? I need to know what I'm doing and I need to have choice. The other question really is linked to the idea of sustainability. Is do our cities allow us to enhance our well-being? Uh, to enhance our well-being without jeopardizing the interests of others or negatively impacting environment? If we answer these two questions, we could be on the right path of creating better places to live. If we are doing that, there are a few essentials that we require. I call it five, five things to deliver successful thriving cities. Political will with the whole smart city initiative, I guess that's there. A very robust policy framework. Definitely not there. We don't have a robust, uh, robust policy framework. Integrated design, um, we've seen multiple examples of how one could do that through the day. Robust delivery mechanisms so that the initial vision is not actually dumbed down as we go through the process. And of course, maintenance and management regimes. Once you deliver something beautiful, you actually take care of it and you nurture it. Policy can and should play a key role across all these levels. I truly believe in that. Um, it really depends um, what we're doing. So if I were to quickly go through this and the various principles of delivering better places, there are scales, that, scales of operation, so going down from the national level down to the building, and there is a process of delivery. Um, what, whichever way you look at it, there is an intrinsic relationship between development policy and the process of development. What we need to do, however, is to design policy for design. We need to know how to use our policy to create the kind of framework we want. Um, there were murmurs through the day by speakers saying, you know, policy is restrictive, it doesn't allow us to better our product. I completely disagree. We just don't know how to create the right policy. Starting at the national level down to the building, there are various tools that you can use. Um, today, I want to be looking at three policy initiatives that I as an individual have been, and as a practice HTAU, we have been fortunate enough to be engaged with. Uh, the first one is at the level of a city. So it's uh, an experiment in itself, and it is enabling experiments. The second one is, the, uh, is uh, a project in the UK, which is Urban Design Codes for the City of Rotherham, a beautiful framework to actually help cities grow over time. And the last one being, what do you do with new townships? Can you create guidelines to actually set a benchmark for the norm? There are special buildings which will always do better than what the norm is, but we need to raise the bench, benchmark. First one, TOD for Delhi. Um, this is the new policy, got adopted by the Gazette of India, part of the new master plan, and a massive achievement, massive, massive achievement. Uh, was involved in it for the last three years. Um, started with a simple thought, which was essentially about a livable city, safer, greener, more civic pride. Uh, put the pedestrian at the heart of it. It was inclusive, egalitarian, environmentally sustainable, um, and was actually working towards creating higher density, mixed use, mixed income buildings, which would help support and encourage the use of public transport. Sorry to interrupt, you have five minutes more. Five minutes, okay. Um, is that it? Okay. Um, what it does is it brings about pa a paradigm shift in planning from going from zonal plans like this to actually restructuring how a city works. Uh, Moving on, from a sprawl, you get more focused areas of intensity of development. And what it does, it actually rethinks how the city works. Looking at mobility down to the block level, looking at mixed-use zones to actually get livelier, more vibrant neighborhoods with lesser travel demand. Um, housing for all, it mandates smaller unit sizes, which means that 30% of every project would actually be for affordable housing. So we ca could get rid of our slums, and actually, once the project uh, policy rolls out, you could get better housing. 
giving you choice, uh, giving you better urban life through tools like setback norms, etc. Uh, moving on, I'll quickly move on to the rest. Um, the second one is urban design codes. It actually is a brilliant tool to regulate settlements. Uh, nothing new, Barcelona and New York were built on urban design codes. They're essentially design rules that are linked to a spatial master plan. Um, this, is a, this is a site in Rotherham near Sheffield in North England, um, right next to the city center, a uh, massive derelict uh, piece of land. What do you do? You design, a you design a master plan for it, but it's going to deliver, get delivered over, say, 20 years. You use something which is called a design code and a regulating plan, which becomes a delivery mechanism to guide development over that time frame. You can code anything that you want, depending on it what you want, what do you want the product to be. From character areas, from street codes, architecture codes, down to parking, you could code pretty much anything. And this is a regulating plan. It's a brilliant tool to actually monitor and guide development over time. It sets out things like uh, building heights, building norms, your street design guidelines, all of it is actually coded back into this one plan. We did design codes for the various um, streets that were there for about nine streets. We also, we also actually talked about a materials and color palette, which is based on the mineral setting of the settlement. So um, extends the idea of the vernacular architecture through uh, coding. Beautiful examples of success stories, New Holland, um, England, Borneo, Sponberg, uh, Bo one in Malmo, Hamabi in Stockholm. Brilliant projects that have come out with coding, a definite tool that one should look at while doing smart cities. The last one, this is an initiative that we were uh, associated with as HTAU. Uh, we were asked by a cement producing industry, uh, company to actually uh, provide a township blueprint for the eight different townships that they were doing. It was a comprehensive guide to actually guide planning, design, delivery, and management of townships. Um, um, so it was, it was actually planned uh, according to the process of delivery, starting from the vision down to management. Um, so the first one said the philosophy and the vision, saying that it has to be exemplar. How do you do that? To do that, we realized we needed a model for sustainable living. Uh, we identified six strands, energy, transport, water, rec uh, responsible environment, working landscapes, waste management, etc., which we thought would be actually uh, interdependent strategies which could enhance um, social, economic, and environmental value of that settlement. These six were then looked at in detail. Looking at interdependencies of each, for example, we looked at what, what the systems and byproducts of water was, exactly the same thing with waste. And then looking at it in that, in that wheel of uh, the model of sustainable living, each one starts adding up. And when you start looking, them as a, looking at them as a system, understanding interdependencies where byproducts of one actually become the resources for the other, you start getting benefits. Benefits of an individual system or benefits across groups of systems, giving you larger benefits for the community. Our initial aim was lowering the carbon footprint, enhancing quality of life, health and happiness, well-being, sense of pride, and a sense of identity and belonging in a, in a place where there isn't any. So these are um, townships in the middle of nowhere, really. Based on that, we then um, sort of redeveloped the guideline further for um, a guide to sustainable master planning, to site-specific codes, implementation strategy, and management regimes. Then we said, let's do a pilot, let's test this. We took a pilot in Belga. Um, this is what we had, essentially flat land uh, with no landscape and a, quite a stunning cement plant. That was the only context we had. So how do you actually use the framework that we created using that blueprint document to actually create a place? Basic site analysis, developed a structure based on climate, based on topography, um, looking at minimizing energy resources, all of that which was, which was governed by the, the cycle of sustainable uh, living that I showed you, giving us a fairly rich um, framework for a place to grow over time. So this, this, uh, these said, uh, cement plants functioned for about 30 to, 30 to 50 years. So how do you create a framework that would actually be robust enough for it to grow from a population of, say, about 1,500 people to up to 3,000. Uh, the landscape became a very essential um, a sort of factor in creating that sense of place. Not only that in terms of a visual um, setting, but also how it worked. So in terms of managing water, managing energy, um, the thing on the right is actually um, Milia Dubai Plantation, which works for energy, uh, energy from um, bio biomass for energy, etc. And various, various strategies were actually put in place to actually come up with something which would also have linked back to how settlements were done in Karnataka. So creating temple chalks and creating squares where people could actually meet, creating a life. Um, worked a lot in how do we actually cluster the community to um, create a sense of natural mentoring that would happen. Um, 
architectural priorities were governed by the local, the climate, the local architecture, building organization principles. Um, typologies were developed to be able to enhance that further. We are hoping that at the end of the day, we would be able to create a place with a soul and really believe we can regenerate our cities and we must create beautiful places, but we must also work at policy um, to be able to create that environment that would allow experiments like these to happen. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, now we have some more great ideas to be shared, to be witnessed. And now I would like to invite on stage Mr. Himadri Das. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, he's the Program Manager of Urban Development and Sustainable Communities at Imbak, at Imbak India. So can we have you genre applause, please, for Mr. Himadri Das? Good evening. Uh, thanks to all of you uh, who've uh, been here all day, and there have been a wide range of things that has been talked about. Uh, thanks to be here, and um, I promise I'm going to take very little time, so keep jumping onto it. Um, I'm going to talk about an interactive tool to enhance participation. So we've been talking all day, uh, and a lot of also discussions about participation and how that is important for cities and going forward into the smart cities that we should be talking about better participation. Uh, what, we, what I'm going to talk about is how to do this participation. So um, what I want to say is um, the case I have taken uh, is uh, based on a book that we have written at WRI. This is called The Safe Access to Mass Transit Stations in Indian Cities. So the idea is that this is, this is, it compiles a lot of work around safe access. I don't have to explain it again because a lot of my uh, co-speakers have talked about it. And uh, uh, what it does is it compiles a lot of case studies, work that has been done by Embark India and by WRI in India, as well as by other uh, agencies in various cities, uh, primarily looking at Mumbai, Bangalore, Hubli Dharwad, uh, as uh, major reference points. So what we're going to do is, uh, wh what we did was we wrote this book, which was a manual, which was a technical guide for um, development authorities to actually do safe access. But the challenge was, how do we manage to make the bridge between this technical guide and the actual audience, which are the people, because those people are the ones who are impacted, as was discussed earlier, by not having safe access. So the, the station area, again, why is the station area is important? Because it's a place not only of connectivity, but a place to work, live, shop, and where play can also happen. Uh, the safe access approach that we talked about and we sort of uh, put together through the case studies has uh, people at, at its center, as you can see here in this diagram. Uh, uh, what I'll do quickly is look at the big picture, uh, which will tell you why safe access is important, uh, which has been talked about really a little bit, so I'll really uh, skate through these. One is that 32% of the total population is living in, in, in cities, and what's alarming in the graph below, it, it says that the total motor vehicle population is actually growing faster than the total urban population of the country. Uh, fatalities, huge number of fatalities, and we see more than 10% are people who are actually wa who were walking or on cycle. And uh, the graph on the on the on the right of your screen, uh, it shows that the from 1994-2003 to 2004-2013, uh, number of uh, accidents have reduced, but number of fatalities have gone up. So, what was the disconnect that actually happened there? Uh, uh, in, order to, uh, in order to counter this, uh, the government has, has, uh, uh, has put out major uh, investments in mass rapid transport. There are six metro rails in op uh, in already in operation and eight BRTS systems in operation, which is, which is actually bus rapid transport systems, uh, and there are many more on the drawing board. So, but at the end of it all, uh, building MRT has lim limited efficacy. Uh, in a city when, uh, when it is not part of an integrated strategy to, make, uh, to improve mobility and make the urban experience better, as you can see here. 
So here is the experiment. Uh, what we did was we took this uh, technical guide and we turned, into a, turned it into a game board, which is, uh, well, it's, it's kind of gamifying the whole thing, uh, gamifying the safe access manual. Um, just to give you a flavor of the kind of things that, that is there here, the safe access manual um, uh, had talks about five principles uh, which are critical to make uh, safe access happen, and specifically around station areas, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, public space, improving, improving public space, pedestrian and cycling uh, facilities, safety and security. Uh, a lot was talked about safety and security in the Indian context. Uh, feeder services, which is really about bus and other auto rickshaws, rickshaws which, which service mass rapid, and parking. So uh, out of the five principles, you can see two of them here. Um, uh, the, that's kind of a zoom, a zoom into the board. Uh, there are also role play cards. The role play cards um, essentially have three types of roles. Uh, so from the left, you have government uh, roles. Then you have a whole lot of citizen roles that you see in the middle. And then you have private entrepreneurs, uh, which are on the side. Uh, also, I might mention that uh, this game, this so-called interactive tool and the game is played in groups. So you need like five members in a group and each of them get role play cards and they're supposed to play a role. How the, uh, how the game is played is uh, step one. Uh, as you can see in the, in the game board, in the zoom in, uh, this, if there is a strategy uh, is designated uh, per table. So if there is a group of five people sitting at a table, you have strategies designated, and there are two sub-items per strategy. Uh, and the sub-items here are actually graded uh, strategies, which could be, uh, which, which need to be, uh, which have, uh, it is kind of shades of gray. There are, uh, so uh, for example, uh, neither of them is a clear answer to safe access, but they all address slightly different issues. Uh, a lot of them depends upon availability of space, availability of finance, so it becomes really a, a complex uh, sort of discussion and negotiation to be able to choose any of these uh, strategies over another one. Uh, so all the participants must choose one option per strategy and all participants must collaboratively choose one option per sub-item. So it's the collaborative uh, part where uh, the, all the team members have to come together and choose one is where some interesting discussions happen. Um, and of course, uh, once uh, the, the ideas, the principles of the safe access are understood, the, the participants or the players are then, then apply their new, this, these new tools to a real site. Uh, what we have done is we have uh, taken this, uh, so this game to three locations in the country uh, starting in April uh, this year uh, at our annual conference, the WRI annual con conference called the Connect Karo, which was in New Delhi. And uh, there are some visuals of it. What we, we, we did here was we focused on understanding the principles of safe access manual only. So it's, it's understanding those five principles. And we simulated the environment of complex layering of principles. We, we had diverse aspirations. So we also addressed diverse aspirations and also the needs of the role. So for example, people who were, uh, you know, as per the role had to act like someone who had a car. So uh, that would be, yeah, so, yeah, and, and put, put the arguments of, of uh, someone who owns a car and how they need parking vis-a-vis -vis someone else who's, who's, um, who's really wanting to have a better uh, pedestrian access because uh, they are going there with their, ch with their child or their granddaughter, so they don't want to be in the way of this uh, motor vehicle which, wants, uh, which also wants this uh, space around the station, station area. So there, it generated some very interesting negotiations and dialogue between the players, and they, were, they, were, they, were, they, they became aware of what, is the, what are the, uh, you know, the, the, what, what, is, what are the issues uh, which need to be dealt with when we are uh, talking about safe access. The second iteration was done at the IHS Bangalore, uh, this is the Indian Institute of Human uh, uh, Settlements. And um, what we've got here is, uh, what we did was we went one step further here. We understood the principles of the SAM as we do, talked about earlier. And here we had a, had a group of academicians and practitioners, but we were able to apply the new, this knowledge or these tools from Safe Access 
to an, an existing site. So what we did was uh, we did a video on the, of the area called Ishwanpur Railway and Metro Station, which is uh, one of the highly congested areas in the, in the, in the city. Uh, and uh, we were able to come up with some kind of uh, conceptual strategies uh, to do safe access there. The third iteration was at Kochi Metro. Uh, this is, uh, this is uh, uh, again, as you know, Kochi. But what was very special about this is that we didn't not only apply it, we understood the principles of the SAM, but we applied it to a real site, which are really two metro stations of the Kochi Metro. But we actually involved real stakeholders. So people who are running buses there, people who are going to office there, people who are um, who are traffic, uh, managing traffic police, which are man managing uh, traffic in that area. So there were real stakeholders who were on board to uh, play this game here. Now, all of so uh, what we found was uh, certain specificities of this of, of Kochi, which is that the, the public transport usage in Kochi uh, is very high, and uh, a lot of people also walk and cycle. So about 63 percent of uh, public transport usage and 15 percent of walk and cycle. These kind of uh, figures uh, were sort of. Uh, it, it came up with, with all the w w discussions because we realize a lot of people are very comfortable with public using public transport. Kochi, you know, is, is a very compact kind of city. It's on the coast, and, and it really grew uh, very fast over the last 10 or 20 years, and uh, hasn't, and, and, and so it's kind of like um, uh, al almost sort of imploding into itself. The players address constraints and opportunities to come up with strategies, and it resulted in very high ownership. Uh, the definition of priorities by players in terms of connectivity. So they identified certain priorities for these two stations, which, uh, which became like, uh, which uh, it would have been very difficult to do the study uh, as, as an outside consultant and be able to quickly prioritize because these, uh, these um, uh, decisions were uh, coming from people who were actually using this place on a regular day-to-day -day basis and they understood what are the big challenges here. Then lastly, uh, documentation is the key. So when we talk to a large group of people, uh, there might be certain people who agree on certain things, but every last proposal is valuable. We need to document it. Well, so just to summarize, uh, how are the intentions achieved? Uh, there are two parts to it. One is the role play board, which really understands the principles, and the other is applying it to the real world scenario. And uh, what normally we put a larger amount of time for the second part. And uh, citizens uh, uh, engaged, as you can see in this, in this uh, table here, in the last uh, set of columns to, the, to your right, uh, at, the, at the KMRL, which is the Kochi Metro, we talked about, we, we, t we actually had people who are stakeholders and uh, people who are uh, actually living and using that space who are coming back and giving us some uh, solutions. Uh, so uh, at the, the bottom row here shows us, oh, so the bottom row shows us uh, the different, uh, uh, the process, which is uh, sessions uh, and role play cards in the first one. The second one was role play on the board and discussion uh, for the real world case. And the last one was really for discussion on real world case along with specific strategies and solutions. That's it. That's how all of you are welcome to come to this site. This is the Embark India Hub to download a free copy of the uh, Safe Access Manual. I hope uh, it can be of use to some of you. Thank you.